seem to sort of just be doing their thing and, and suddenly they got people listening to them. Stop making the eyes at me, I'll stop making the eyes at you. No, I mean, I, I, the reason I like the Arctic Monkeys is because they sound so Manchester. I think it's fantastic, you know, it always reminds me again of uh, the Mondays, you know, Stone Roses, all them lot, the best, so it's nice. This is the band you've got to love. This is the band you're going to love. And you tell people that enough times, people start to believe it. Well, I, bet that you look good on the dance floor. I don't think the Arctic Monkeys need that much yeah, advice. You know, I, I, they've, they've got a pretty cool attitude towards it. They're, they're remaining themselves unfazed, yeah, you know. They seem pretty level-headed. Yeah, yeah. They, 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 they seem pretty unimpressed by fame. I wish you'd stop ignoring me because it's sending me to despair. I think they wanted to prove themselves as a decent rock band, not a one-trick pony, and not a sort of a buzz band of the year. They came from nowhere to rule the charts, storm dance floors, and shake up the music industry as we knew it. And yet the band themselves hardly batted an eyelid. This is the story of the Arctic Monkeys and how they became a phenomenon almost without trying and sometimes almost without knowing. The band first came together in the high green area of Sheffield after childhood friends and neighbors Alex Turner and Jamie Cook asked for guitars as Christmas presents. Shortly after, Turner enlisted Andy Nicholson to play bass and Matt Helders found himself behind the drum kit simply because it was the only instrument in the band not taken. With that, the first lineup of the Arctic Monkeys was complete. They were still sort of uh, 16, 17. I think that's pretty much is the trend. I mean, like most, most people do get interested in music at that point and start developing their own tastes. So the fact that they formed so young in itself isn't necessarily so uh, phenomenal or strange, but the fact that they came on so quickly and, and uh, made so much progress so quickly, that was particularly interesting. The city of Sheffield has a long rock history. Although it has always had strong links with electronic music, thanks to Cabaret Voltaire, Human League, and the Warp Records label, it has also spawned such names as Def Leppard and Pulp. But the Arctic Monkeys have relatively little in common with that lineage. Instead, the world beaters in waiting were more inspired by the friends around them who had formed bands. It's always been a, a very lively scene in, in Sheffield and in uh, South Yorkshire particularly. Uh, there was particularly gu guitar bands. You seem to get either guitar bands or electronic based bands. Um, I think they kind of snuck up behind everybody and just suddenly appeared on the scene. There was a real passion there. I mean, a lot of them were playing the local clubs. and. It kind of went from there. I think everyone was spurring each other on. It was, a, you know, it's an exciting thing. You know, it happens everywhere sporadically, but Sheffield, you know, had its turn. The Arctic Monkeys came out of a, a scene that was being slugged the the New Yorkshire scene. I guess bands like Kaiser Chiefs and Franz Ferdinand were before them, but they were really the ones that came and put put Sheffield on the map in that sort of North Yorkshire scene. Uh, with them, other bands like Oh, uh, Reverend and the Makers, bands like that, who they basically put the focus back on at that point. They all kind of influenced each other very slightly. Um, with the Arctic Monkeys, it was very much a seemed to be a clear agenda from the start that you know it was very much singing about you know what was kind of happening down their street and in you know in their evening out and what have you. And and the interesting thing in terms of influences, they 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 didn't really seem to sort of know who they'd been influenced by. Um, certainly, Alex w was um, in my early kind of conversations with him when. He, he would say, you know, who did I think they sounded like? And I thought, you know, they sounded like there was bits of maybe the Kinks in there, and there was bits of MC5. There was all sorts. There was maybe, you know, there was Ian Jury and the Blockheads in there, and and then somewhere in, in there was this sort of northern thing going on. And and he reckoned he hadn't heard of half these bands. The pre-signed, you know, early landmark gigs. But when they first headlined the Lead Mill um, in Sheffield, I mean, they talked about you know when they were boys going there to watch a band um, and finally getting to headline it. And when they did headline it, they sold it out instantly. So 
you know, they obviously had a, a big fan base at the time, so I think that was a, a real seminal moment for them as far as, you know, I mean, they've, they've, you know, they've played around the local, you know, pubs and clubs, but, you know, the lead mill, I think, was the, uh, the landmark one. As they began to build a live reputation for themselves during 2003 and 2004, the band laid the foundations for something that would radically change the way bands found an audience. The Arctic Monkeys chose to give away a selection of their demos to gig goers. The hope was that fans would become increasingly familiar with their material and help create a better atmosphere at future shows. It wasn't long before this tactic began to pay off handsomely. They particularly had a unique kind of uh, take on watching bands who would quite often say things like, you know, at the gig, at the end of the gig, they'd say things like, well, we've got some CDs on the sale, they're only three quid. I think they found that a little bit repulsive and uh, they felt that uh, they didn't want to be, you know, there's another band that does that, you know, kind of like uh, sells themselves in that kind of blatant way to people who probably aren't interested anyway. So um, they, they circulated demos and uh, the internet by then was pretty much an everyday thing for people who are into music. So uh, these fans, I mean, it's a simple extension of word of mouth, but word of mouth via file sharing and MySpace, but uh, the common misconception is that they had a, a MySpace site that, that was set up by them. It wasn't, it was set up by their fans. And that was particularly what helped um, circulate their music and made people familiar with their music before they even released a single. I remember the, them saying they came off stage and they were just blown away by the reaction from the fans. People even then knew their songs, singing along to the words. A few months later, I think they were playing the Forum in Sheffield, and again, that was very significant because the whole crowd knew every word to every song that they played. They hadn't released anything by this point. They'd just been giving out free demos at, uh, at the gigs. People had been swapping them, copying them, putting them on the internet, and they said from that point, they knew that one, the internet was gonna be their best friend ever, and that uh, they were really gonna be something special. The internet, I think, just really, just well, particularly obviously MySpace, got them that audience outside of town. I mean. And, and really the, the word spread, I mean, it was just perhaps the, at the time the biggest and best advert for, for what MySpace could do for your band. And uh, you, suddenly you got you know, kids in, in, in Japan you know, singing Mardi Bum and singing these sort of phrases and what have you that they had no idea what they meant. And, um, and yeah, I mean, just it was no one, including them, could have predicted how the internet would, would drive the whole thing. And I think it's... I mean, you, you couldn't really say it was responsible for their success, but it, it certainly initiated it, and certainly it got the music out there in, in a way that no record company at the time could have, have hoped to do. It would have taken a colossal budget to get it to that many people so swiftly. That kind of created this kind of fan base, still fairly underground, but still very much in place, very firm, and uh, and uh, that fan base definitely connected with Alex Turner's lyrics because it was definitely, it was A, it was being written by someone who was very close to their age, like pretty much late teens, and it was about the experience of being young, being into music, being intelligent, and being from a city like Sheffield, which is a, a, a city that's replicated across England and Britain many, many times over. So, there, you know, there was, there, that's essentially where, where the, the seeds of their, their success started through their fans championing their music just because they liked it. Finally, in May 2005, the band issued their first official release, the now fabled Five Minutes with the Arctic Monkeys single on their own Big Bang imprint. The two tracks showcased all of their strongest assets. The A&R stir they had been creating previously now turned into frenzy, and despite the slew of interest from the majors, the band opted to sign with Lawrence Bell's independent domino label. Whereas many of the big boys had been trying to persuade them to alter and compromise their music in exchange for larger amounts of money, the Arctic Monkeys were more interested in the idea of complete artistic freedom. I think it, the way Arctic Monkeys did it with their marketing and using things like MySpace, although they, they still claim to the day that that was set up by a fan of theirs, the MySpace site, but they obviously believed a lot in file sharing and letting fans promote them for them. Um, I don't think any of the record labels are going to go out and burn their marketing budgets just yet. I think you know they're not going to suddenly devote 100% of their time to the internet, but I think certainly it made record labels and the industry think, we can use this. We can, this, is, this is another string to our bow in terms of marketing. It gets smaller bands 
to the, to the height of fame quicker and it gets the word out there quicker, which is obviously what it's all about. I think it frightened the life out of the industry. I think th they know th the, the record industry was obviously aware of the internet and it was, you know, there was downloads. And they were, at the time, I think they were more worried about fighting illegal downloads and file sharing. I think suddenly when they realised that this band, by design or accident, could suddenly reach audiences on the other side of the world with minimal cost, I think it, yeah, I think it really it fired a rocket up the backside of the industry. And I think they've had to be, become more aware of that and they've had to change. And obviously with diminishing revenues and, and, and marketing budgets within the record industry, they've had to look at what the, the Arctic Monkeys did. And uh, you know, obviously ever since there, every other band wants to kind of utilize the that it like that and obviously a lot more bands have become more um, DIY and, and I think you know I think it's probably it will it's, it, the change is still being felt but I think it will it will herald a, a lot more strength for independent labels and, and bands just doing things totally for themselves and slipping the reins of, of, of the, the big corporates. The summer of 2005 saw them play a rapturously received tour of the UK topped off with an appearance at the new band tent at the Carling Weekender which proved to be one of the event's major talking points. Because their music had been circulating amongst the fans for many months, the entire crowd sang virtually every word, and it was clear to see that stardom beckoned. Just two months later, their debut single, Proper, I Bet You Look Good on the Dance Floor, hit the shelves, and the Arctic Monkeys had really arrived. It's just a great, great pop song. It really is. It's got a fantastic chorus. Um, spits out the lyrics so fast in in the verses. It's just brilliant. When you've got Tom Jones covering it, it's uh, that's, you know you know it's pretty pretty successful. But um, yeah, I personally think you know certain romance or 505 is you know their best songs. But that's a personal opinion. Public absolutely loved that song. I mean, they just, it went insane. It went to number one in the charts. People were downloading it, swapping it, file sharing it. You couldn't, everyone at uh, Kerrang Radio was talking about it. We hadn't even started playing it ourselves and everyone was talking about it. You've got to hear this band. We were passing it amongst ourselves. I don't tell anyone. Um, everybody was doing it. So everyone wanted to hear this band. Who were they? This, this is incredible. So it was the best advert they could ever have done for themselves, I think. It's something that they experience week in, week out, every Friday and Saturday night. It's the experience of seeing someone who you basically you lust after, um, but knowing that that person knows that you're lusting after as well, and it's an ex it's the interesting exchange of uh, you know looks and suggestions and and all the rest of the things, all that kind of courtship, all that kind of Saturday night courtship that happens all the time, everyone experiences. Uh, again, nailed to the absolute point of exactness in terms of uh, Alex's kind of wry, witty, um, satirical, you know, uh, portrayal of, of that experience. They're singing about stuff that, you know, kids on a night out in Oslo will be going through, or, or you know, soccer, or you know, there's wherever you go in the world, where, whatever city there, are, you know, there are kids being sort of dodging the police and getting into trouble, you know, tripping up outside shops and you know sleeping shop doorways and you know all the rest of it and having trouble with girls and um so yeah i was i was slightly surprised but um but as when I, when you sensed that everybody was catching up with what was happening on the net and the, the buzz that was already there we just kind of thought well this is inevitability this is gonna this is gonna be number one it's yeah it's all gonna be it's all gonna be colossal well, After about the third time I heard it, it was single of the year, 2005, no, no danger at all. And uh, I don't think anyone looking back in 50 years time or whatever will listen back to the music of 2005 and think there was anything better than I Bet You Look Good on the Dance Floor in terms of singles. For a debut single to hit number one was impressive enough, but the band's impetus had yet to reach anything like a peak. 
The follow-up single, When the Sun Goes Down, again reached the top spot, and their debut album, Whatever People Say I Am, That's What I'm Not, was easily the most anticipated musical event of the year. Even though many early versions of the songs had already been released for free, the album still broke records in the UK by shifting over 360,000 copies in its first week, making it the fastest selling debut in British chart history. Whatever people say I am, that's what I'm not, summed up the experience of being young, intelligent, and hormonal in modern Britain. It was clear that the Arctic Monkeys were speaking to a generation like no band had done for years. Said who's that girl there? I wonder what went wrong so that she had to roam the streets. She told the major credit cards, I doubt she does receipts. It's all not quite legitimate. I wanna school me man. Just give him half the chance, I bet he'll rob you if he can. Can see it in his eyes, yeah, that he's got a driving ban among some other offences. The debut album of Arctic Monkeys was a phenomenal success. It, it, was, it was actually quite frightening how well that album did for them. The world went mad for it because they'd been told for so many weeks, months, this is the band you've got to love, this is the band you're going to love. And you tell people that enough times, people start to believe it. I think it's, it's a great debut. I don't think it's, it's, it's consistent necessarily, but when it is on its game, when it's at its peak, there's not really much that will touch it in terms of British music. When it first came out, and in that first week, obviously it was shifting phenomenal amounts, and we were we were being quite anoraki about it. We were getting the figures as, as, on a day by day basis, and we we were writing a, 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 a major piece in the paper every single day because you know Sheffield obviously knew the band, and and the the record was flying out and it was clearly became evident by the middle of the week that this was going to go go to number one it was it was the far going to be the fastest selling debut album um, of all time the Arctic Monkeys on their debut album were very much into a bit of a theme running through it they picked five or six tracks which basically told the story of a guy a guy that they knew a guy that we all know who uh, works during the week works his watches off during the week to earn enough money to go out at the weekend and get absolutely wasted. Hang out with his mates, pull girls, get in the odd scrap here and there, get in trouble with the police. And they're basically, five, five, five or six songs told the story of his week. The album title is uh, Whatever People Say I Am, That's What I'm Not, which is taken from a, a classic British ki kitchen sink film called Saturday Night, Sunday Morning. And I think if there is a theme to the album, and I think there is, I think Saturday Night, Sunday Morning, those four words are essentially it. Red Light Indicates Doors Are Secured is it, it's, it's one of my sort of favourite tracks on there. And um, I'm right about them because I think they kind of, they're very reflective of, of that period of the evening or whatever they're, they're singing about. I think it, it really, for atmospherics and, and for a sense of place, I think you're right there. And, and knowing that, you know, knowing the, the, the city very well. Um, um, and the kind of nights out you know, they, they, they're sort of talking about on here, it, it's, it's, it's perfect. They say that once in every sort of 10 years, a band comes across and they're going to be the next biggest thing. But, you know, in this day and age, a lot of it's, um, you know, they'll sort of set you up to knock you down almost, you know. Um, but, you know, Arctic Monkeys sort of lived through it because they had the songs. It was as simple as that. They had the songs, you know, the lyrics, you know, 
the guy's a poet. You know, he was saying stuff that everyone was feeling at the time and it wasn't necessarily like a social thing. It was an observation, but it was uh, almost taking what the streets were trying to do and or are doing and putting it in an indie format, which, you know, just works so well. It is the experience of, again, the experience that unites so many young people of going out uh, or preparing to go out on a Saturday afternoon, the experience of going out on a Saturday night and then the come down and the reassessment that happens on a Sunday, which can be very sobering. It can be quite amusing, but on, for the most part, it's, it's a come down. It was a good album. It was a good album. It was, uh, judging by them from the first single, it was exactly what people expected of Arctic Monkey. So I think buying it, People were like, this is great, telling all their friends is exactly, you like that single, you will love this album. I can name certainly my favourite songs, I mean, it's not too difficult for me. I, I, I really enjoy the Arctic Monkeys um, when they're at their most kind of visceral. So, A View From The Afternoon is great, it's a fantastic track. Um, I think, you know, and again, obviously people had known them by, by then, but um, also, uh, people have known, like, uh, I bet you look on the dance floor and Fake Tales of San Francisco, but they still stand out. Um, I think they're still, like, my favourites, uh, two, certainly two of my favourites on there. And, uh, but I think in terms of when it, when it sort of sags, um, you can notice it. For me, sometimes it, I think the album, it drags a little later on, but then it's, it, it's very much so. It's like you know, it is like it's like a, a typical long drawn out night out. And I think you know, it, it, it's very good at I think it's very good at reflecting its its subject matter. And I think it's got you know a lot of atmosphere. And there, I guess there are tracks I'm, I'm not as keen on, but there's nothing I dislike on there. There's a couple of standout tracks like a Bay Lagoon Dance Floor and Mardi Bum, um, but I think the rest just kind of are very samey. So I'd say anything outside those singles and like I said, tracks like Mardi Bum. I just, I'd say they're all weaker than the singles because they're all very much of a, uh, very much of a muchness. But generally speaking, like I said, it's it's a, a really really strong debut, um, with with more peaks than troughs by a long way, definitely. Following their inclusion on the prestigious Enemy Tour during January and February, the first of many awards befell them, including the magazine's own accolades for Best New Band, Best Band, and Best Track. Oh, the enemy absolutely loved the Arctic Monkeys when they first came around. It was like someone had reinvented the wheel. It was ridiculous. It was like, you know, there were, I think when the single went to number one, the, the headline on the front page was, what Britain's been waiting for. It's like, well, oh, come on, this is a band. But enemy, abs the, the enemy absolutely went mad for this band. They just couldn't get enough of them. They're still doing it today. They're still talking about how this band are the best band in Britain and all these, you know, they, oh. And I think without enemy, Arctic Monkeys probably wouldn't be where they are today. Certainly the Arctic, early Arctic Monkeys fans bombarded the enemy with, with emails saying, look, you've got to watch out for this band. And so, they, you know, it was unavoidable for them that they had to kind of sit up and listen. And, you know, they, yeah, they, they, their reaction was slightly, I guess, probably they were responsible for the hype in, in that they were very much making huge statements about the Arctic Monkeys and calling them, the, you know, the, the most important band this year and what have you very early on so yeah it was in some ways it was probably it was typical enemy championing you know another band as they did with the strokes and you know they, they've always done really we were covering them well before their first single was out um we covered them well up to the reading performance at 2005 because prior to that we'd been talking about them and when reading came around this was still two months before their first single proper came out when reading came around everyone knew about them and wanted to see them and so were absolutely like you know that was a, you know eagerly awaited performance of that weekend and uh, it didn't disappoint and then after that there was really no stopping them the week that they had their first single out and then we had them on the cover and i think that will go down as uh, one of the big covers certainly of that year and probably years surrounding it as well because uh, it was a moment where i think uh, again enemy was very, very uh, closely related to a development, a significant development in British pop culture, uh, as it has been pretty much for the last 50 odd years. They refused to perform at the Brit Awards and instead filmed their acceptance speech for the best British breakthrough act with Keith Murray from American band We Are Scientists posing as their frontman. 
Arctic Monkeys are not your typical rock stars. They are quiet. They are not big spending, Porsche driving, bleach blonde haired, bimbo flaunting rock stars in any way. They are just normal lads who don't really like talking about themselves, especially in the early days. They hate talking about themselves and their songs and what they were all about. I last spoke to Alex just ahead of the, the second album coming out. And this was the same lad who I spoke to, you know, before they were signed and, and after they were signed and, you know, the day before they went to number, their first number one. And they're very, very unaffected lads. I think to, to go what they've gone through, to go from playing to 30 people in a pub to playing to 100,000 plus at Glastonbury, they're the most unaffected individuals I've ever met. They came into Kerrang Radio Studios uh, in their sort of early days and refused to play during an acoustic session, refused to play but he looked on the dance floor. They just said, we don't want to play it. And that was the whole reason they'd come in for. They just they do not play the game at all. Uh, they, they play it in their own way, but they certainly don't play the, 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 in the media way, as a lot of rock stars do. Despite being the most in-demand band in the country, Turner & Co. remained distant from the media circus, refusing the majority of interviews and TV appearances. Their approach to marketing the album was unusual too. For rather than milk their success in the time on our way of lifting a string of singles from the album, the Arctic Monkeys opted to issue a five-track EP, comprised mainly of new material and bearing the unbroadcastable title, Who the Fuck Are the Arctic Monkeys? The band were matching the prolific work rate of bands like The Smiths and Oasis. In current day modern, modern rock, if you like, uh, the tendency is to release an album and then flog it to death for two years. Uh, which is standard practice pretty much, but it's also extremely boring, uh, particularly for the band involved. And whilst most, most bands will go along with it because it's financially beneficial and that's what they're led into by people who work for them, Arctic Monkeys didn't want any of that. They wanted to get, keep a kind of head of steam, keep their creativity up. And people would have criticised them for, uh, you know, uh, trying to capitalise on their popularity by releasing an extra EP. Um, that just seems ridiculous because they're given they're given uh, their fans like more tracks, you know, new material, very strong material as well. As an EP, Who the Fuck Are the Arctic Monkeys is kind of a follow-on from, from the debut album just because there were a, there's a, there's a re reworking of an album track on there. There was actually a complete album track on that as well. It's almost like um, if there were five secret tracks on the end of the album, these would be the five secret tracks. It kind of fits like that. It's a little bit of a step on, uh, but not so far that it's a completely different project. It's similar themes run through it. Uh, as I say, reworkings of an old demo track as well. In terms of the content, I think it was it was it was the kind of it was the stuff that wouldn't quite fit on the first album, and, but also what it was you know they were itching to release something because they'd all the, the second album was pretty much all but written, and it was that segue. It It was just them, I think, stretching their legs a little bit after all the kind of you know the Ferrari that su that surrounded that first album, and it was. Uh, yeah, I think it was a good little indication as to what was coming. It was then the band suffered their first setback when bass player Andy Nicholson announced he would not be joining his colleagues on an American tour because of fatigue. Shortly after, he left the band for good. Although the band continued releasing new material, this time with the Leave Before the Lights Come On single, Nicholson's exit came completely out of the blue and seemed more than a little mysterious. It was very unexpected. Um, certainly in a sort of public way. I mean, no one really expected a band, a, a member of a band who are currently pretty much on top of on top of the world, um, you know, to just sort of say, oh, I don't really fancy doing this anymore. It was quite a shock in that respect, and uh, I'm sure a lot of people thought he was having some sort of mental breakdown as a, as a result, because why would any sane person do that? But, uh, you know, the, the touring life is, is not for everyone. Definitely not for everyone. And uh, I think Andy Nicholson was probably felt that uh, it, he was one of those people. 
Well, I mean, I don't know him personally, but they say that he left because of fatigue and, um, you know, the fame of the band suddenly shot up so much that, you know, apparently it was just a bit too much, which is understandable. Um, but, you know, there's no hard feelings with uh, the boys in the band. You know, I, I've seen them a couple of times and they're still mates and, you know, we saw them at festivals together and I think he's actually working on a new project. So it's all good. Yeah, I just think it was a bit too much. No, I don't think it was bitter. Um, I mean, they're still mates and they still hang around and, and you know, when they when they would, did their um, Carlin weekend, their Leeds Festival, certainly at Leeds, he, you know, he, he was still knocking around with, with, with Matt the drummer and, and, and the rest of the band and they're all you know they're all still very pally. I think for Andy I think it was just it was um, it was probably more of it was the lifestyle change I think if you put yourself if yourself in their shoes of suddenly going from as I say from playing pubs to, to, to stadiums and to being sort of, I don't know, fairly innocuous character who plays bass in a, in a little local band to suddenly being thrust into every tabloid. Not everybody's going to want that and not everybody wants to deal with, or can deal with that. And uh, I think, you know, I don't know Andy so well, but, you know, he's a nice lad and he's, 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 he's a, I think maybe he just, he just maybe didn't want that. There was certainly never a falling out. I think it was just, you know, things change and, and, uh, and they, you know, their lives changed so dramatically and it's not everybody's cup of tea. With the band eventually appointing Nick O'Malley as Nicholson's permanent replacement, the Arctic Monkeys continue to pick up accolades at every turn. Most notably, the world famous Mercury Music Prize, which they are awarded above Muse, Tom York, and their personal favorites and fellow Sheffielder, Richard Hawley, amongst others. The band donated the money to charity. The winner of the 2006 Nationwide Mercury Prize is Arctic Monkeys! <laughs> Monkeys could please come up here to collect our award. Up here, gentlemen, please. Oh, 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 Somebody call 999, Richard Hall has been robbed. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, thanks. Thanks, everyone. And who else agrees that Jules don't look like you were born in 1958, does he? Oh, everybody I does. Jules don't look like you were born. Anyway, tears, I've got nothing yeah, else to say yeah, that's no, funny as that. I mean, um, <laughs> I, I've got, I don't know if it's as funny as that, but I mean, it was definitely. Uh, no, thanks ever so much, like everyone that's helped us and that, and um click click click. That's all you could hear, yeah. isn't it? I think I'm as well. Get and um, no, because normally, I'm, uh, you know, I don't go to a, a band that's, I suppose, sold as many records as we have. <laughs> like, but, to put it bluntly, but like, you know, but it's still, you know, we're very, very pleased with it because it's just like good talent. Good, yeah, good tunes, really. That's like what. What I think we like to try to do. Oh, oh, oh steady on. And um, <laughs> and and no like tricks really, because there's too many people trying to do too many tricks. So like, thank you so much anyway. Yeah, it's and, yeah push on. In terms of pressure, I think Arctic Monkeys handled pressure incredibly well. They are so laid back, and I think they're almost they're so confident in their, in their own abilities. Without being arrogant, they they know that they can write good songs. They know that they've got the backing from the fans, the backing from a good record label. I think in terms of pressure, they were just if you don't like the second album, you don't like it. Lawrence Bell at Domino Records is known for being, you know, a quite an artist-friendly kind of person, and he's not so much a kind of money counter, uh, which is always the way for record labels that don't actually make that much money. Certainly previous to the Arctic Monkeys and front bands like Franz Ferdinand, but I think that's also why the Arctic Monkeys wanted to sign to Domino, because they knew that they wouldn't have that pressure. They wouldn't. They knew that they wouldn't have people knocking on their door every you know, five minutes saying, where's the album? We need an album because we need to sell some units. And uh, the, the artist's freedom, I think, that's involved with being on Domino is something that uh, they were attracted to. And again, it shows that they were canny to, uh, to pursue it because 
it meant that uh, there wouldn't be so much pressure on them to deliver. Uh, and they, they took that in precedence to a hell of a lot of money, you know, that I'm sure they were getting offered initially. So that, like I said, is something that uh, would have been, you know, helped their longevity and have helped their sanity in the long run as well. A full year after they first hit number one with I Bet You Look Good on the Dance Floor, the band began to record a new album. As with any such act who had enjoyed so much success so quickly, the pressure was on the Arctic Monkeys to prove themselves, but they quietly went about the business of creating a more aggressive and muscular sound with celebrated producer James Ford. The first fruit of this collaboration emerged during April of 2007 in the shape of the driving comeback single, Brian Storm. Yeah, I would have thought, you know, it's probably the same sort of, a, you know, hype for the second album. Um, maybe not as much, um, but I think that there was a lot more pressure on the boys. Not that they really felt it, I don't think, but there was a lot more pressure on them to, uh, you know, to come up with a killer second album, which they did, you know. But the hype was there, yeah, of course. I mean, it was like any big band releasing an amazing debut, you know, you're always going to hype up the second one. And, um, you know, luckily for them and luckily for everyone, it was a corker. I think Brian Storm was a single, it was an incredible comeback single. I mean, how could it be a comeback? They weren't away for very long, but it was the big, you know, the big, have they still got it? Were they just a one hit wonder? I think they came back and proved that they can do what they do well and they can do what they do better. You just have to listen to the first, like, five seconds of, of Brian Storm to, to know that uh, this is a band that have really moved up a couple of gears. Matt Helder's drumming is certainly something that comes across really strongly in that song. And as a drummer, obviously, I'm going to be listening for that anyway. But uh, I mean, it just powers that song. And it doesn't have that kind of like, you know, like a catchy chorus, perhaps, that uh, I bet you'll go on the dance floor had or whatever. Um, but you can tell it's a band that are really doing something different, moving on not content to be, again, not, not content to rest on their laurels. Brian Storm, yes, yeah, I think it's a great track. Uh, it's definitely the best uh, first single to come out of the album, I think. You know, amazing drums. It was obviously, you know, they were being a lot heavier. Um, you know, they already said that they were listening to a lot more stuff on the road and on the tour, you know, Queens of the Stone Age and stuff like that, and you can hear it. Um, you know, amazing drums. Um, yeah, and amazing lyrics. It's, it's what you expect from the Arctic Monkeys, but you could see that they'd taken a notch up. You know, it took it to the next level. The guitars were a bit crunchier. It was an edgier track, sl sl slightly less accessible than some of the earlier stuff. So I think they were challenging their fans a little bit, but I think they proved that this, this was a very talented band. One week later, the eagerly awaited second album, Favourite Worst Nightmare, went straight to the top of the charts selling more than the rest of the top 20 combined in its first week on sale. It was also a great critical success. The Arctic Monkeys' great musical development was there for all to hear. I was lucky to get enough to get an interview with Alex the, the, the week before that the second album came out and, and we talked about pressure. And, um, he says really they didn't feel it so much. That He said there was the pressure that they feel is, is what they put on themselves to try and maintain, I guess, the quality or, or just or just to keep up with everything that's going around them. The hype around the second album was interesting because the hype around the first album and the first single had been so rabid and so um, internet-led that I think by the time they released the second album it was, it was almost expected that it was going to be big. Flicking through a little book of set tips Remember when the boys are all electric And now when she tells she's gonna get it I'm guessing that you'd rather just forget it The critical response has been quite funny in a certain sense because uh, there was one write-up in The Independent, I remember, a live write-up, that, uh, that kind of remarked in a kind of, uh, a kind of begrudging way almost that uh, the most disappointing thing about the Arctic Monkeys is their complete failure to be terrible, which I think is a great, great way to kind of sum up, you know, the expectancy and uh, the hype around it. Favourite Worst Nightmare did live up to the expectation of the fans. Um, you know, it's been, uh, again, massively well received, successful. Um, you've still got tracks on there that you can relate back to the last album, um, you know, such as Fluorescent Adolescent, you know, it's it could fit right into the first album. It's witty, it's clever. The lyrics, again, are, are, are perfect. Favourite Worst Nightmare got some real mixed reactions from the fans. Uh, some 
fans said it was amazing, the best album they'd ever heard, better than the original. I think I read somebody somewhere, somebody had written it blows the first one out of the water. Other people said it was, oh, that's the first one all over again. It was people worried they were just, Arctic Monkeys can't do anything different, almost like a one-trick pony, which they are recycling again for their next album. I think, I think the fact that it was not a bad album, and in fact it was it was a good album, I think uh, no one was disappointed with it by any stretch of the imagination. A lot of people love that album, but I think there wasn't that excitement about it, uh, and I don't think they, uh, I don't think they maybe did quite enough to satisfy all the fans. That maybe some fans wanted something completely different or completely phenomenal, like we'd all been taught, taught to expect from this band. But I don't think they quite reached out. Arctic Monkeys are showing in this album that they're a serious band. They've turned up the, the volume a bit. They've, they've, they've developed into a strong rock band rather than um, you know, a kind of okay, kind of musically musical band, but with great lyrics. Now they're kind of balancing up a bit more. Alex Turner's, Turner, Turner's lyrics are still, you know, by and large, absolutely spot on in terms of their their wit and satire. Uh, but the four of them as a band, they really kick a lot of ass these days, and I think that's uh, that's something to be admired. It earned them a lot of respect. It's 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 they've stretched their muscles a little bit. They've they've, you know, they've done they've got the quieter tracks on there. They've they've messed with different sounds, and I think. No, I think in some ways it's. Um, I mean, I still probably favour the first album, but I think it's. It's certainly it's 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 a it's a, an evil a slight evolution on what they've done, and I think it's uh, no, it's a, it's a it's a it's a good second album. It really is. It doesn't let them down in any way, and it's 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 strong. It's got it's it's got different strengths to the first album. All the boys are slack. The best you've ever had. The best you've ever had is just. A I think the second album had some great standout tracks and I think tracks like um, uh, D is for Danger was good, um, Teddy Picker again, Teddy Picker, this, that great rolling riff that runs through it, a great introduction to, um, I think it's the second, second track on the album, a, a, amazing, I think they just proved that they can still do those chunky guitars and those cheeky lyrics. For me, I mean the singles I think, you know, are great and Fluorescent Adolescent was, you know, immediately for me was probably my, I guess my favourite track on there, um, but I like the, you know I like the mellower moments on there. I think 505, and, for instance, and it, you know is, is a great closer, and um, you know it's suddenly you've, you've got you've got on there, and in, in the midst of all the kind of the, the big stuff, you've got Alex kind of crooning, and it's and and you know them turning the volume down and showing that they can. I know they did that on the on the EP, but they. It's showing that they they have got this kind of slight more a bit more diversity to, to their sound and and uh, you know and they, they're good musicians. I mean I think what, what we sometimes gets forgotten is they are good players. They're good at what they do. Fluorescent Adolescent is uh, the is a, a bit of a favourite of mine. And D, D is for dangerous. Um, and there's a there's a there's a, lyrically it's quite interesting because there's a lot of kind of sexual references and and what have you, which is always interesting. But again, the way that the band sounds as a unit um, comes through strongly on those tracks, and uh, it really pricks up your ears, I think. When you, when you put on paper what the first album was about, um, it's the subject matter, some people would say, well, it's so blindingly obvious that it's almost cliched. But there's probably a lot of, a lot of musicians a lot of bands who perhaps kick themselves for for not doing that. I think you know there's there's a lot there's a lot of kind of there's a lot of dreaming in in, in music, and there's a lot of escapism in music. And I think this was this was about escapism on your own doorstep. And I think Alex, a lot of the time, had captured that very well. He's it's um, and he's you know he's a very he's a very very clever. He's very clever with with his with his words, and. I think it was there's just a great sense of perhaps honesty there, and, is it, and, and just you know it's certainly to people English, people living in an English town or city, there was a, a, a tangible sense to, to what he was singing about. He talks about subjects that we all understand or we all can imagine. Life up north, it's hard, it's tough. Working in a factory, um, you fall in love with a girl, she she lives somewhere. You know all these issues that everyone has to deal with every day. But I think it's the way he puts them down on paper. I think the way that the words, he's a real wordsmith. I think he, um, he makes you laugh with his songs. I think he turns those gritty, day-to-day -day mundane issues into a, a very fun story. That every, and who doesn't like a good story? Beyond that, they're all, they are, beyond the lyrics, they are just 
you know, bloody good tunes. And I think that's what draws people in, even if they've not got the lyrics straight away. They've, they you know, they, they they like the music. So it's, um, you know, it works on so many levels, and that's why it's that's why it's a success. I would say Alex Turner is definitely a great songwriter in the making. I think he may even be there now. I know he's still a young lad and he's only got two albums under his belt and a handful of singles. But I think, I think he's proved that he has got an incredible um, turn of phrase. I think he knows exactly what words to use, how to make people laugh, how to make people enjoy um, the story he's telling. I think he's only going to get better. I think what he can prove himself to be uh, and is already in the process of doing is certainly um, someone who um, kind of represents a generation. I think he represents a generation of witty, intelligent people, uh, young people who like music, who uh, not, who don't suffer fools gladly. And I think that's, that's something that Alex is, is representative of. When you've got 50,000 people, the bulk of which are singing back, arms around each other, singing back the lyrics back at the stage, and knowing every single line, um, I guess yeah, that that makes him a great songwriter. Perhaps you know, in the in the in the in the sense of you know, Noel Gallagher, you know, is a, a considered a great modern songwriter because you know he can get an entire audience singing about every lyric. And okay, there are other bands who do that, but it's um, I don't know, in terms of sort of touching so many people, um, yeah, I think I think if you can pull it off. A couple more times, then yeah, it'll be considered one of the greats. There is now less hype surrounding the Arctic Monkeys, and no one will be more pleased about that than the band themselves. The four youngsters have emerged from the constant media glare and scrutiny from fans and journalists alike to establish themselves as one of the biggest names in the business. They have avoided overexposure and the determination to keep control of their own destiny means that the Arctic Monkeys bandwagon won't be derailing for some time yet. The future of the Arctic Monkeys I think is interesting, precarious possibly. They have got, they've got to prove I think that they have still got what it takes. Album number three, uh, is that going to be as good as album number two or album number one? Alex Turner is already working on some side projects with other people. So I think they've maybe got to keep him interested in staying with the band. I think he wants to stretch his legs. Well, what does the future hold? Whatever you know, whatever they want it to hold, really. It depends on depends on them. But they're already doing it. You know, what they just did at the uh, Lancashire Cricket Ground. You know, sold out two nights. Um, you know, that can definitely be likened to Oasis. You know, when they did Nebworth. Um, yeah, I mean, they can go from strength to strength. I'll be interested to see where they go on the next album. But um, you know, if they continue just evolving like they are, then. You know, future's uh, future's bright. How much bigger can it get? <laughs> that you know, selling out Old Trafford Cricket Ground for an entire weekend—it doesn't get much bigger than that. I think the future for the Arctic Monkeys um, can almost be anything they want to be. Um, in a certain respect, There's, you know, they, they could quite easily uh, go wrong. It's not as if they're completely flawless, but uh, it's a little bit early to tell. I think there's 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 no doubt. There's no way that anyone could doubt that uh, they have the talent and uh, the, the wit and the canniness to have a very long and fruitful career. But uh, whether they capitalise on that, whether they even want to capitalise on that is another question. They, they're obviously they're growing all the time in, in terms of, of the, the sounds that they're listening to and they, are, you know, they, are, they, certainly Alex listens to a hell of a lot, a variety of, of music that he never used to listen to. Um, and that's got to have an impact. Um, so I think sound-wise, I think they've got to, they're going to, they've got to kind of keep evolving. Um, but all the while, you've got someone with Alex's voice, which is you know instantly recognisable, and they've still got their Yorkshire accents. They're always going to be the Arctic Monkeys. Um, it's how where they take that is is, is so difficult to tell. Um, they could do they could do a swing album next. I hope not. Four.